Okay. Okay. Go on. We're hot. Uh, one thing I'm going to tell you before I forget. When you get your sheet metal, make sure it does not have any scratches in it. If you can go over it and there's a scratch deep enough, your fingernail will catch it. Even though you scale it, you texture it, you do everything, when you sand it down, that scratch is still going to be there. So to do this, try and find a source where they don't mutilate it before you get it, and then be careful with it. Um, the feathers and the leaves, like just doing a plain feather or, or a leaf that I'm going to color that gets sandblasted, I don't worry about it. But anything that you're just going to sand, like the eagle or the don't, the don't tread on me, if there's a scratch in it, that piece just doesn't look good at all anymore. Um, I did some fish, and I was trying to figure out how to do, you know, their, I think that's their dorsal fin, I'm not sure, um, and not, not have to raise that. And actually, the way your lines face, when you raise that whole fish and use your butchers around the outside of it, it gives the illusion that that fin is standing up. So if, if we have time, I'm going to try and sh show this. Um, I've done the chisel work on it. I'm going to do the scales in my detail line. And I'll start with the detail line. This. Now, a lot of these lines, when you use your butcher on the outside of this fish, are going to get smashed. You just have to go back and go over them. You can use your lines to show direction, to show like motion, like a wave breaking over and the directions it's going. Lines are just really, really handy things for detail, because that's really all it is. Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of lines. And if anybody has any questions, please ask. Do you ever buy your steel with laser foam on it or some other type of coating? I don't know, does it? I don't think so. We do buy from a shop that works with the unions because then we're getting American made steel rather than stuff that comes from China that you don't know what's in there. So that's, that's one thing we do do. <laughs> well, I, you know, doing this, if I have something with, there's a soft spot and then there are hard spots, I'm hitting pretty much with the same, same hardness or the same force every single time in certain areas. And what you if you... different marks. Yeah, you get a totally different mark. So this is just suggesting scales. So that's a curve. This is a curved chisel, and after I'm done with this, I'll pass it around.
and I'm not hitting where my drawing is. It's not that important for this where they're just spaced out everywhere. Okay, at this point, I'm going to pull the paper off. Mark, was this a, a punch? Did this and not a file on the curved chisel? Uh, make those, I just take a, a little wedge block and a puller. Drive it down in halfway and then grind the back off. Right. Oh. Yeah. Couldn't be much easier. Yeah. This is it. This oh, is your switch switch. block. That's my little switch block. Do you use one like that? Yeah. Okay. You took that in and try to hammer in a puller. Yeah. Depending on what how big you want the okay. the curve. Right. You do that like, on pretty much all sizes? Yeah. You got several different sizes. Like that hot Mark, you do that hot? Yeah. Thanks. That's not very unforgiving when it's cold. It's not real nice when it's hot. But you're not going to do anything when it's cold. But try it. Okay, I do have some butchers that are curved. And when I, I want to have a concave curve in something, I'll use these. Mm -hmm. Because if you use your straight butchers, you'll end up with just really nasty chop marks in it. Ooh, let's see. That's not the one I want. Okay. So what I'll do... This is supposed to be the gill. So you see the direction I have my, my butcher facing? Because mm -hmm. I want the side toward the body to look like it's lower down. And this is going to be kind of quick and dirty. OK. Um, I'll do the whole outline of the fish and the fins. See how I just went over that fin and, and it pretty much got smashed. And I'm not going to worry about it because when I go over it at the very end, I can put all that back in. And that's an example of how when you hit lighter, can you see that at all, how it came to a very narrow tapered line to end? And it makes your, your work look a whole lot more pleasing. Okay, let's see. These rounded butchers are kind of hard to use. Because they do, they, if you don't have it at exactly the right angle, and the right orientation, they leave 
horrible lines or horrible, horrible tool marks in your work. Okay, for this, on this little line, I'm going to have my butcher with the heel facing it toward the, the um, fish's body like this. When I go over to this side, I'm going to flip the butcher around so it's always facing the outside of the body. Because if you use it on the inside, it's not going to make this appear to be raised. You want to look over my back? You can stand behind me. I don't care. No, okay. it, it doesn't bother me, okay. really. Sorry. Just so you can see what's happening. You bother me. And then flip it around the other way. Okay, now you're, you're starting to get the illusion of how that fin goes. Come on, hold it up for him, please. Go ahead and do the outsides of these. And the angles on these butchers is so absolutely critical. And on, on the edges of them that you don't have an absolutely sharp corner, because if you do, it'll just gouge into the metal. I think these are one of the hardest tools to learn how to use. Oh, thank you. Curved one for in here. Got it so quiet, guys. All right, that's the first pass. I'll do the second pass, hopefully fairly quickly. And then maybe we can raise a little bit of his body. Do you do any 
mitigating of the stretching while you're in the middle of the work, or you wait until it's all over and then come back and try to stretch it? Uh, it, it depends on, on the piece of work and how cattywampus it's gotten. Because sometimes it gets bad enough, you absolutely have to. Um, or your tools just bounce on it. Also, that's another thing is, when you're hearing what I'm doing now, it's just a dead thump sound. Your metal is going to work harden while you're doing this. And when it work hardens, it makes a higher pitch noise. You can also feel it um, the way the tool is hitting. And you can see your metal's not moving. When that happens, put it back into the fire, bring it up to an orange heat, let it air cool to get it dead soft again. Because otherwise, you're just beating your head against the wall. It's not going to move. It's not going to work right. It's just going to make you mad. It can also work hard enough that you'll crack the metal. And if you've spent like a mm, couple weeks on a piece and you do something like that, yeah, it's a whole sentence of four letter words. <laughs> you get really creative in what you say. And, oh, unbelievable. And, <laughs> and, and to me, if I make a mistake, the piece is trash. It gets thrown away. Like on the, um, the don't tread on me, when I realized, wow, these scales look absolutely horrible. And I started over on it. And my son said, well, what are you going to do with that other piece? And I said, well, you can use it for target practice. He does competitive shooting. He said, I can't shoot that. And I said, well, if you don't, I will, because it's not going anywhere. It's garbage. Because I don't want anything going out of the shop with my name on it that looks like junk. I mean, it's just a standard that I guess I've set for myself. But you don't, if you're doing this and you don't want something going out of your, your business that doesn't look right. Or that you know isn't right. Uh, somebody asked earlier about other ways of removing the scale. Um, like pickling it using vinegar. And yes, I do use vinegar on some pieces. Um, there's a fish hook that I did. I don't know where, do you know where it is, Mark? Is it in, it might be in the, the van. Yeah. Um, I pickle those in vinegar and then paint them. But like anything like the feather or things that I have undercut, I don't use a pickle because I'm afraid it might rust under there or it might rust in those hollow parts. Um, anything that's totally flat, like the fish, that if you can find it, I'll pickle it. It's not a big deal. And then, you know, neutralize it. I did um, some salad tongs in stainless, and I pickled them for, I think it was at least 24 hours in vinegar. But I found out, too, that the stainless is very nasty on your tools. So after you pickled and you neutralized it, do you have any issues with rusting? No. Oh, with mild steel? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can. Like. When it's all clean, shiny, sure, shiny metal, um, some people have fingers or some chemical in their makeup that causes things to rust. 
and if they touch it, it's like instant rust. Um, my granddaughter does that, so she doesn't even touch my tools anymore, uh, which is kind of sad. And what I do to protect it is I use Brunel's water displacing oil, which is uh, used for guns, and let that sit on there for about 24 hours, wipe off any of the excess, and then I'll use Renaissance wax over that. And it, it protects it pretty well. I've had a couple pieces in our house that I haven't even waxed for over a year, and they've been fine. If you use the, um, the traditional finish of your boiled linseed oil, Japan dryer turpentine combination, which a lot of the, the um, Gothic type stuff is finished with and yellow used. If you use any colors like your, your tempering colors as part of your work, that the linseed oil darkens over time and actually turns to a brown color. So you lose all the colors that you've put on. And somebody said, no, actually what you're losing is, is your oxidation colors. Those have disappeared. So I stripped the piece with lacquer thinner. The colors were still under that finish. And that's why I don't use that anymore. I mean, it's excellent finish, but it depends on what you're using it on. And I also found out that if you just put Renaissance wax over your, your oxidation colors, the colors kind of disappear. Or they turn dark and mute. But if you use the oil on it and then the Renaissance wax, the colors stay a lot better. I don't know why. That's the water displacement oil? There. Yeah, Brunel's water displacing oil and... Um, I think I'll, I'll show you all that stuff on Saturday. And the way I found these out, and I don't know the technical reasons why they work, is I've just goofed around with it till it works. In other words, as Mark puts it, you have way too much time on your hands. <laughs> yeah, that would be benefit from your experience. Oh, I hope so. Well, with the oil paint, with getting that to work, oh man, that took a few years to figure that one out. Because it was just like, well, you know, I, it's a cool way to color the metal. And I had tried the Gilder's paste. But I called the company and I said, you know, how light fast are your, your colors? And they said, well, our, our ones that are metallic colors are, are, are pretty good. But why don't you experiment with the other ones and call us and tell us? <laughs> it's like, really? I'm going to buy your product and then do your work and call you and critique it? I don't think so. I, and I thought that was really a bad answer. <laughs> Ev evidently. Need Pardon? You need an agent. Go on, be mine. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing that for you guys, and I'm not using my work to test your product. So um, that's kind of how the oil paint thing came along. And the piece in the, the gallery with the goldfish on it, that was... I think the first piece that I ever, you know, put the oil paint on and baked it in the oven. And it didn't used to have paint on it. It was at a gallery. And I think it was in Houston, Texas, in a show. And somebody must have spilled a latte or something like that on it because it was just covered with goo when I got it back. So it sat in the house for a while thinking about, you know, what do you do with this? And it was like, okay. 
you know, strip it, play with it. So I ended up, um, previously I'd, I'd use the oil paint. And then when I put the Renaissance wax or Johnson's paste wax or anything like that on it, all the solvents in the waxes removed the paints. So it kind of, and I think it was Mark had a gun stock that he put in the oven to harden the linseed oil. And I said, I'm, you know, what's going to happen if I bake this at a very low temperature for many hours? And it worked. So, yeah, we have weird things in our oven. However, now <laughs> Mark bought a, a stove for our shop, so we can cook our metal up there. I mean, it's bad when you're going to bake a cake and you have to open it to see if there's anything else in there. <laughs> a Renaissance wax was developed in Great Britain. They use it on their antique armor. It does not discolor. Over time, your Johnson's paste wax will discolor. It'll turn darker or yellow. So Renaissance wax is a little bit pricey, but you don't use very much. And since it doesn't discolor, I've been really happy with it. Johnson's Paste Wax, on the other hand, used on stuff that you want to look black, you can really carburize it with heat, and it makes a really nice finish, really nice satin black finish. So you put it on, you'll tell us about that. Well, I do that on some of Mark's stuff. Um, How are you carburizing? With a torch or with a forge, either one, until it's nice and smoky and stinks. Just hot and smoky. So you can't stand the stink of it. I don't know how to explain it. And it does smell bad. Okay. So I'm going to put this on a piece of lead and try and get it a little bit flatter and then flatten it from the front. And if I was doing this at home, I'd probably go around it again with my butchers. A good, a good project for learning how to make straight lines is making a ginkgo leaf and making all the veins. All, a ginkgo leaf, you know, what the, you know what those look like with all the little veins and everything. Um, I have one on my phone. If you want to show it to them, the stainless ginkgo, the salad. the salad things, yeah. And I found out that when you're trying to learn to do this, if you just sit there and make straight lines, you're going to lose interest in it really quick. Make a project to do to do it so there's light at the end of the tunnel rather than just like I'm going to lose my mind doing this stuff. On this, 
um, gill. I'm not going to use a flatter because I want it to look like it goes down under there. Here, let's see if he can. And I'll sometimes use my second pass butcher to get into places. And I can tilt it back and kind of use it as a flatter in some of these weird areas. What I'm trying to do is get rid of this ridge. I'm not doing a real good job right now. There's one other thing that if you feel like your tool is going wrong, then it's not going to hit right, you can just lift your foot up and things will stop. <laughs> I mean, really, because right there I almost hit wrong, and I just went like that, and the hammer stops. And so many people have asked me, well, why don't you put a, why don't you put a motor? Why don't you get a different power source? It's like, well, number one, it'd be dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, number two, I have the ultimate of control with this. I do have a round flatter. It doesn't have any sharp edge, but it does help get into certain areas. Once in a while I do, but not very often. So I got one real strong leg and one <laughs> gimp leg, you know. Now it seems like I have more control with this leg. Yeah. Maybe because I'm used to using it all the time. I know I take a lot of kidding about that. Here, I'll give that to you. Like when you're sitting there right now, your leg is completely relaxed. You're not, not holding not, it up in any way. Yeah, so I am. Spring makes, oh, you are. Yeah, I am. Well, okay. 
Touch that with your fingers. Just push on that with your fingers gently. Oh yeah, I see it's almost nothing. There's nothing. There's no resistance. Mm -hmm. And this one has more resistance than mine at home. Uh-huh. So, so you have to um, hold your leg up. Yeah, you gotta hold your leg up. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can just use your toe to move that. You don't have to use your whole leg. Yeah, it's, it's, pardon? Um, Mark can explain that to you. Well, the bushings too that you use. And, and that's something people say, well, with that treadle hammer, you can't hit hard because, you know, because they see what I'm doing with it. Mm -hmm. Take that out. You can slam things with this. It's just the way I'm using it, and I'm using it gently. Mm -hmm. um, Mark can use it for other things. It's not just made for chasing and repose. And when you so put what's the chain used for? The just chain to, just to keep from smashing, from smashing my hands. Yeah. Huh? Oh the seat bounce stuff, yeah. And always if you're if you're putting your hand under a treadle hammer, number one, always make sure the chain is adjusted right. What I do is all my tools are four inches long. The longer the tools, the less control you have of them, the more likely they are to kick out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I'm holding my tool, my hand is down like this. My hand is down on my work. It steadies my hand, it steadies my work. It gives me more control. Um, I forgot where I was going with this. But, you know, short tools, hand right. down on it. Keep your hand down to test it. I know how long my tools are. Right. I put it, it's not going to come down in my hand. It might touch my hand. It's not going to smash my hand. Mm -hmm. Every time you use your treadle hammer, check it. Make sure it's right. Because an accident with that would be absolutely horrible. I mean, something, something like that coming down with any force on your hands, you just lost your hand. Yeah, it's not going to come out of it looking good. No, not at all. Never worked the same. Nope. Okay, what I'm going to do is go around this fin the second time, and then I'll just raise this part of the body to give you an idea about that. you'll see this makes it appear even deeper.
And I put fingernail polish on my things when I went and taught so I would get my tools back. Right. And then I put this most awful color pink on it, and I'll be darned if somebody didn't have the same pink fingernail polish and did the same thing. It's like, oh, no. Mushroom where the it will a little bit eventually. Yep. Mark, do you heat treat the S7 to spec? Not to spec, no. You don't quench it in water like earning the real, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> that that has to be crap. What? I'm, I'm not going to distract the bird real quick. If okay. anybody has any questions. A lot of times what we'll do is, is I'll demonstrate doing this and then Mark will talk about the tools. And it kind of takes up the boredom time. The other thing I've used for coloring is, you know, the brass brush and heat and gun bluing. And they all work really well. The brass is left behind. Yeah, if what I do to do the brass brush is I you can get a Dremel, put a brass brush in a Dremel, and it really transfers it very quickly. And Oh, brass brush, yeah. Gun bluing, or not all three at the same time, or that too. I've I've done one thing where I've done a couple of them, where actually um, I I sand it all down to bare metal. I use the bare metal as one color for white. Use a brass brush, you know, for to color leaves with, and then I use gun bluing on the background. The leaf picture you sent around on the frame, was that? That's, that's oil paint. That's what? Sorry. Oil paint? Oh, no, the, on, the, on the phone? That was stainless steel, and the color on that was just reflections from the background of the room. Yeah, it's, I think it's in that box up there, Mark, with the books. I think that's where I put the business cards. I hope. I hope, I hope. Anyway, so you can see the difference in this, where I've gone around it twice, how much deeper it is. You guys see it? So now I'll bring this up fairly level, and I'll go around the outside edges of this with my flatter.
tried to play around and we happen to have a, an aluminum plate, would you, would you not recommend flatting on the aluminum just to? If you have aluminum or copper, it's really nice to work with. It's really soft and really easy and you wouldn't get discouraged as quickly. Um, when I started doing it, I made some leaves and I started working with copper some. Copper is slippery. Your tools will skate on it some. Um, steel, it's not as bad. Um, but as far as learning how to do it and learning how to raise things and do all that, copper is excellent. Aluminum is good. Don't ever hit it hot. I'm more, I'm more meant for a oh. backing plate instead of the lead. Oh, no. Use the lead. Use lead. Use lead. Aluminum's too hard for that. Oh. Yeah, you gotta, use, you gotta play with lead. I just asked for that. Yeah, no, it's, it, um, it might work some, but I, I don't think it would work as well as, as the lead. So what I'm doing is going around this with my flatter. And it will actually make this fin looks like it's standing up a little bit more. I thought you meant just playing with the aluminum and doing the chasing in it. Oh, well, I might try that too. So it's cool. It, is, it, it turns out pretty cool. And we have a bunch of aluminum to play with because Mark had to fix somebody's truck and they bought a great big four by eight foot sheet and just wanted a little bit and said, you guys can have the rest. It's like, okay. That works for me. Nice time supply, yeah. Probably. Okay, and lost the cameraman. <laughs> you get a lot of breaks at cameraman union. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I have so far on that fin. Show it to you guys. It really does make it Doesn't it? If you go around it twice, it makes a big, big difference. And I'll try and get this up to level. And then what I'm going to do is, with a ball peen, raise this part of the fish. Mm -hmm. So this is brass on, on mild steel? That's a brass brush on mild steel. It's all one piece of metal. Thank you. And we use the cold bluing. And you got to do it really fast because it, it dries quick. Is it cold blue? Yeah. Describe that? Ask Mark for the description of the cold bluing. Okay. You get it from, where did we get that from? Brunel's also, Brunel's, I think. Yeah. It, uh, I forget what the name of it is. Oxy blue or something like that. O Oxbow or something like that. But painting it on with a paintbrush is a pain in the butt. <laughs> and you can use black and black and blue oil paint and get the same thing, but I hadn't tried the oil paints at that stage of the game. So, um, 
Oil artist paint. And there are a couple kinds of different artist paint. Um, I get mine from, from Dick Blick's, or Dick Blick has a catalog that is really good. And if you go on their website and go to Artist Oil Paint, they have a chart of how light fast different colors are the pigments, and everything else. So base it on that chart, what you get. Um, what was that name again? Dick Blick. I've got their catalog, and later on we can just put that out, or we can put it out Saturday. And Is that what you used on the, the sunfish and crappie? Yep. Okay. Yep, and there's two different kinds of paint you can get. Okay, there's my ball paint. Um, I'm finding out the, Grum, was it Grumbacher? I like them better. Um, it also tells you on that chart if it's opaque or, or translucent. Get the translucent colors because they turn out a lot better on metal. The opaque, you can't see the metal through and I'll use, I have two different fish and um, you can tell on that which paints I've used. Because one, it's just, it is just so cool. The other one is like, okay, it's painted. Okay, I'm going to raise this part. I don't know what time it is. Quarter after, so we got, we got some time left. Okay, to raise this, I will use my ball peen hammer under here. If you're hitting something really hard, or hot. I use my ball peen. If you're using your small tools, it's a 7LW um, vice grip. And you just put your tool right in there and it holds it. Because if you're hitting tremendously hard, you don't want to put your hand under there. You can see, I better show you guys this. You can see the line from the back, so I know where to raise things. I know where to hit. Are you raising the fish body now? Yeah, I'm going to raise the fish body a little bit. So that's from the back, so it, it gives you an outline. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm just walking this tool along here. And you could do this hot if you wanted into a piece of wood. Have you ever used UHMW? What's that? Evidently not. <laughs> high molecular weight, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Yeah, ultra Ye high molecular weight polyethylene. It's just a really stiff plastic. Yeah. But but it's got enough give. It's it's almost rubbery, but not Some, somebody gave me some, and it doesn't have enough give. And then Mark's an electrical lineman, and you know the blankets they throw over the power lines? And that stuff's pretty soft. It didn't work either. And you just doomed to lead, lead and wood. Okay. Unless you want to use pitch, but then you got to clean it off all the time, and I don't use pitch because I don't want to clean that much. And I keep flipping my things back and forth all the time. So I think I'd just be a cleaning lady to pitch. So. Um, Yeah, if you're, if you're using the lead, use common sense. Well, I was just thinking that the EPA man would have less grief. Oh, that's okay. You know, what the EPA is doing in Illinois, we live um, near an aquifer, supplies water for 750,000 people in central Illinois. 
how about they think it's fine to clean up Chicago and put PCBs on top of our aquifer? And if it would contaminate our water, the dump company will supply all of us with bottled water. Forever. Forever, yeah, right, until they declare bankruptcy and leave. So, um, you know, the EPA may be good at sometimes, but right now I don't have too much respect for them. You know, they shut down the last lead refining yeah. company. So, so what happens to our, our country if there's a war and we can't produce any of these things because the EPA has shut everything down in this country? Where are we going to be? Well, we'll, we'll just we buy it off the internet. Yeah, right. So many people are going to be so willing to sell to us, right? Where is lead for batteries? They have not shut down lead recyclers, but there was one company left in America that was authorized to refine lead from ore, and they've shut them down. They shut them down. We can go to lithium ion batteries. Take a photo of my flash when we go on. And why so it's different warning. between okay. recycling existing lead and refining new lead, why, why that's different, nobody seems to understand. But we have driven the last company out of business. Thank you. And that's stupid. In one a word. Yeah, I mean, that's, you, you just wonder what is going on. But yeah, after, after and, and what it amounts to is central Illinois is not Chicago. Chicago's just, you know, they're nasty. Let's, let's put it that way. They're, it's, it's a dirty, polluted city, but it has a high population. And what else I found out, it has a high population of poor people like we don't in central Illinois. Um, but because of that, they want to take care of the poor people who, quote, can't move away from this pollution. So we'll just send the pollution down to you guys. Well, that's what they did when they changed so. the direction of the Chicago River. Yeah. They made their pollution problem. No one had to change their lifestyle. Yeah. And it all went downstream to yeah, to wherever, yeah. who they don't care about. But the way I look at it, you know, we have less population in central Illinois. However, we do feed them. They have seemed to have forgotten that <laughs> little issue. And we must keep Chicago clean. But, you know, if we ruin your, your backyard, it's okay. And what they had planned to do is clean up a town called Summit, Illinois. And I think Summit is a dump of a nation. And clean up the CP PCBs. Well, the PCBs are burning underground in Summit. They bury them, and they're burning. When they burn at a certain temperature, it gives off dioxin. If you remember Love's Canal, that's dioxin. So that's what they want to bring to us and put on our water supply. So no, the EPA, if I use lead, it's OK. <laughs> anyway, this is what we've got so far. So you can kind of see. Here, I'll hold it up here for you. Can you turn it a little bit? So there you go. Like that? Yeah, here, watch the monitor. Yeah, that shows nice. OK. Um, and you can see how it's it starting to make that fin. From a distance, it looks like, OK, that fin is raised up. And it's really not raised up. And I can do this a little bit more. And this, this dumb company, we had a very, very corrupt uh, state's attorney at the time. And he and some of the other county board members signed an agreement that nobody on any future county board could say anything bad about the dump. 
or they were in violation of the contract and the county would lose, what was it, $3 million a year or something? Two. Two? So needless to say, there's quite a battle going on. Okay. So this is how this fish's body is getting raised. And you can see how much the metal has bent. So this happens with every project you do. You get, get the metal gets. Can you push the edges all back down the line? I'm going to push it back down. I'm going to use my first and second pass butchers around the outside of this fish again. <laughs> and this you got to start doing kind of carefully. Probably if I was at home, I would put it back in the forge and, yeah. But you don't have that much time. See, the EPA was right. He's dying of emphysema. <laughs> no, I couldn't believe the guy came out. You know what you people die of? Yeah. Probably do better than he would. You know, no, I didn't. Um, well, this is, this is the argument another one of them had with us. Uh -oh, I can't find one of my butchers. Um, they were arguing with the people in Dewitt County that if you, the PCBs were not that bad, and this old guy who was their spokesman, Stan Black, um, said, I wouldn't mind drinking a glass of water that was contaminated with PCBs because it's not going to do anything to you. And I so wanted to say, yeah, but you're already ready to die. <laughs> I bit my tongue. I just, you know. Pardon? Oh, yeah, I did. I certainly did. And then I went to, they had, they had, you know, that guy from the EPA, and then they had some of the e other EPA people there. And I went to one of their scientists, and I said, uh, would you drink a glass of water with PCBs in it? And she said, oh, absolutely not. I'd kill you. <laughs> cool. And I kind of push it down a few times first before I hit very hard. I have my tool, I think, tip back just a little bit. Doesn't it? Yeah, you can definitely notice it. And you don't have to have a death grip on your hands or on your tools. Um, you know, hold them snugly, but you don't have to squish them till your knuckles are white.
if you absolutely, absolutely are sure you can't draw and you want to do this kind of work, Dover Book has, has books with designs in them that are copyright free that you can use. I think the only thing they don't want people to do is absolutely copy their designs and put their names on them and sell them. So there is, there is a way around that. Or for you that aren't married, you can find a girlfriend that does drawing. So this is what we've got now. And from the side, it's still kind of bent, but not as bad on that side. And you can kind of, whoops. Can't get it at the right angle there. Have you done just the one edge of the body there? Yeah, I just did one edge. If I I'd like to be able to do a whole project, but there's there's not time to do it. So what I did is took pieces of everything I've done in the past and demonstrate how to do the pieces. I think we did a, I did a whole piece in West Virginia, and we were there for very late at night. Okay, then I'll use my second pass butcher up along here. Some of the things we have at home, um, we cut out with a plasma cutter. And a lot of the things like feathers and ginkgo leaves and things that are, what, totally different from one another, um, I chisel cut. And the cleanup time with the chisel cut, about the same as it is with a plasma cutter. If you, pardon? And you've got a beveled edge. And you've got a really cool beveled edge. And you don't have to file to get the beveled edge. You see how I'm hitting lighter to go to the end mm -hmm. to make a, a better finishing line. With this, I can go right up to the fish's body and put the lines back in that I have totally trashed. This tool, I'm angling it back. I can almost use this uh, butcher as a flatter. OK. If I just angle it back like this, this curved one, I can use it like a flatter, and it works real well. I don't do that with my other one, so.
Okay. Are you really pushing that material on any theory of that particular? Pardon? Are you really pushing, that's an exaggeration, are you really pushing the material on any theory of that particular butcher? Or are you no. It's, it's just, it's just, what this heel of this butcher is doing, if I use it at an angle, it's working like a flatter. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, what I do if I want to push the metal down and under, I'll put it on a table with a clamp on it. And I got... These two little tools. Don't know what the names of them are. Yep, you want to see it too? Okay. And what you can do is you can put this tool to angle like this and just tap it with a hammer and push the metal inward and clean up your edges. Anyway, I should use a flatter on this, but why don't I show it to you? And okay. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay, from that side, it doesn't show real well. However, if I go right about there, is it showing it? So you can kind of see how it's raised up. And from the back, that's what it looks like. So this is how you raise the eagle. This is how I raise the eagle's head. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of his head I did hot into a piece of wood. Because that's 12 gauge and it's pretty hard to move. Right, because it's so thick. It's so thick, it's so heavy. So you use a piece of wood underneath it? I'll use a piece of wood right on top of this anvil. Right on top of the anvil. Yep. And when you're doing that, exhale the whole time you're doing it because it is so nasty. Uh, I could use it. 12 gauge, that's about 8th inch or so. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it seems like, you know, everything I, I started doing was 16 and 18. And then I started playing with 14, and then 12 gauge, and then 3 16 plate. Uh, the 3 16 plate, I made a tabletop that's 22 inches in diameter. But I didn't raise anything. Mm -hmm. And that's another interesting thing is... If you're making something just with your butchers and not raising it, mm -hmm. how do you make something look like it's further in the background? Right, I see. Question. Oh, I don't know. I actually okay. use your flatter. No. Would you hit harder or softer on the things that are in the background? Would you make a deeper line or a lighter line? Lighter, lighter. Exactly. So you hit really light on the things that you want to appear in the background. It's just the opposite of what you would really think you'd be doing. But the things you want in the foreground, make a deeper line around them. And in the background, a very shallow line. And you can really get this illusion of depth. And the tabletop is flat. You can set a glass on it. It will not rock. And we put it in a gallery. And um, to keep the tabletop on the base, I didn't want to make any holes in it or have anything really come over the top too much. So there's snakes around the table legs, and the snake heads are just up against the edge of the table, and they're holding it in place. And thought, you know, either people are going to like it or they're going to hate it. So, and somebody bought it in less than two weeks. So, evidently, she didn't mind snakes. It sold for 7600. How much? 7600. Mhm. Mm so. That doesn't seem like enough. 
Probably not. Um, I did another table with, with scallop shells. One was on top of the other. Mm -hmm. And that one sold for 84. Mm -hmm. So. But the tables are big. They're hard to do. Remember, I live in central Illinois, the land of the tight wads. Right. Well, the people in central Illinois, we've had them come into our shop. And the comments will be, is, gee, it's beautiful, but it's not totally utilitarian, so why would I buy it? They have no appreciation of artwork. It's just, it's just like a, a, for, for, you know, unless you're at the U of I or um, ISU, and even there, you don't do much. Um, you make stuff, and you get it out of there. It's a, it's a lot cheaper place to live than it is here. Mm -hmm. But still, you don't have a market for what you do because of the, right. the attitude. And we live in a very agricultural community. Now, if I want to get all these little dings and marks out of here, I have to heat this thing up because it has work hardened. But, oops. Sure. Oops, James. <laughs> I would have to, um, to get this line smoother, anneal it again because it is work hardened. Okay. But right now I'm going to pass it around. And how much time do we have? We got five minutes. So maybe I ought to talk about something rather than starting a new project. So does anybody have any questions? Have you ever tried uh, any of these techniques in either in slightly different iron, like rock iron, pure iron, anything like that? I don't have any of that. I would love to do it, but I don't have any. How about copper or brass? <laughs> copper works extremely well. The one thing you have to remember about copper is it's kind of like stringy and slippery and your tools will slide on it. Um, copper turns out beautiful. I've done a lot of stuff in copper and it's, it's really nice. It's just really different to work with. You have to anneal it very frequently because it work hardens very fast. I've done sterling silver with this treadle hammer. I've done fine silver with this treadle hammer. Um, sterling kind of is like copper. The fine silver is so soft when you hit, you can also almost watch a wave of metal move. It's really interesting. And you can hit soft enough with this to work silver. Just clean off any lead residue off of anything because the lead will kind of corrode into the silver. What do you wash the lead off with? Um, I just washed it off. Just wash it, okay. Um, Put it down the drain like you do on the table. Yeah, right. Yeah, something to cover up the PCBs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the PCBs and the MGP stuff, well, they told us that, that they put put rubber liners in there that would last a thousand years. Like, you know, who's tested that, guys? But then they put the, the MGP waste on top of the rubber liners. It's a solvent, but guess what's going to happen? It's going to eat through. So it's, you know, it's just we want to clean Chicago up and you guys don't matter. It's all Yeah, exactly. Anyhow, back to metal work. No, I haven't. Have you ever had a desire to? Um, I don't know. It'd be, you know, I, I like experimenting. I like playing with things. Yeah, so. Titanium's really tough stuff. I just wonder what it would do to the S. I just wonder what it would do to the tool steel. Is it harder than the tool steel? Oh, is it harder than tools? I don't know if it is or not. It's probably not hardened, I don't think. 
Maybe. You know, it'd be, it'd be interesting. It's got some nice colors to it. Yeah. It'd be cool to try. Yeah, you know, I'm up for trying anything and see, see how it works. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing is when you're doing this, um, I taught myself how. And it's really interesting. I thought, oh gosh, I'd like to get some sterling silver and work with it. So I looked up the phone number of a uh, you know, jewelry shop that dealt with, this guy dealt with sterling. And he said, well, who taught you to do the chasing and repose? He said, I said, I taught myself. Well, he said, well, then I don't know what kind of job you do. I'm not going to sell you silver. And I said, okay, whatever. You know, it's like, really? Somebody told you that? Uh-huh. You know, you're, you're not. Where'd you learn? What school did you go to? And when I told him I taught myself, then it was like end of conversation. I won't sell you any metal. You taught yourself. Yeah, but that was from New York. So that was the attitude that I got from New York was, you know. We probably should break for lunch. Uh, forging competition is after lunch. I mean, uh, tonight after supper. And the okay. group project is right after lunch. Okay. The weather vane. And if anybody, after, after all that's it over, what, you have 8 to 10 and open forge? Well, tonight or? it's going to be the forging competition. Okay. So it, okay. Uh, may be pretty busy in here tonight. Yeah. Well, how about Friday night if there's nothing? Um, if anybody's interested, I can show how to make a whole feather. And chisel cut it out and everything. So. Thank you. Thank oh, you're you. welcome.